morning. Come on, Pastor, kick it off. So that um, we've been talking about the righteousness, being righteous, being right in right standing with Christ. We've been talking about the armor of God. So just a, a, a when I say a recap, I mean really not even a recap. It's more of a, a foundational thing. Since Easter, we've been talking about um, because of what Christ did on the cross, he took our place. And because of what he did, because of what he did, we now can stand and say that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that we are in Christ, right? And so what that means is that every day we can wake up in the morning and we could take take our rightful position in Christ. We could take our position in Christ. Can I see that first slide, please? We could take our position in Christ because he gives us the victory. We've been talking for four weeks now on the fact that we don't wake up and fight for victory anymore. We can fight from a place of victory every day. So we stand in that position and then we can put on our righteousness. We can put on Jesus. We can put on the full armor of God. And so Ephesians 6 is where we've been hanging out. We've been talking about putting on the full armor of God because if we are the righteousness of Christ Jesus and we are in a war, then now we can stand and we have got to um, take that position, put on that armor, and we've got to go after the enemy who is after us. Let's take a look at the um, Roman soldier's armor and we're going to kind of take a look and we're going to keep going. I know that you're going, but this is Mother's Day. Aren't you supposed to be, you know, preaching a Mother's Day message? Well, um, by divine... Uh, set up from the Lord. Nothing's coincidence. It's all divine appointment, right? It's all divine appointment. Thank you. It's all by divine appointment that we would be talking today about the breastplate. Last week we talked about the belt. Today we're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protects or guards against our heart. So if you're going to be talking to mothers, we'll be talking about our heart anyways, right? Because right. that's what we women do connect with so well. But I want to talk not only to mamas um, and not only to women, but I want to talk to anybody that has a heart because the enemy is after our heart, and we're going to see that. So we're going to stick with the armor of God. We're going to have a little bit of a slant to it, but we're going to launch into that second piece, which is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, guys, let me bring your attention to the screen. I want you to remember uh, this is what Paul was looking at. Remember, the apostle Paul was serving a prison sentence, and more than likely, he was actually chained to an imperial Roman guard while spending time in prison. And so what happens is, is actually, as Paul was chained to this guy, Paul looked at the armor that this soldier had on and began to explain the armor of God that you and I must put on every single day. Can you say amen? Now, guys, let me show something to you, if I could, quickly. Uh, we got a great visual uh, last week we talked about the belt of truth. Today is a breastplate of righteousness. And uh, we have Cole coming out in just a second in some awesome Roman gear. Look at that. Woohoo! Now, can Look I tell you, stud. Bubba, come stand on, on, on my left hand side over here. I really wanted to wear Andy. this pretty bad last night. Patrick, Patrick, will you do me a favor? I think there's something on the roll. Would you, would you put up? Ah! Now, hold on. Last service, Anthony didn't know. Pastor didn't know we were putting this up. Not but at all. I sent a text to Andy. I said, hey, remember I sent that to you the other night? Can you find that and put that up there? <laughs> anyway, sorry, we had to do that. It's Mother's Day. I can do whatever I want. All right. Here you go. Uh, how many of you saw Chris right, Farley movie, down. Fat Thank Guy you. in Little Coat? Come on, that was me. <laughs> I really wanted to wear it, and when I wore it, I thought, dude, I feel bad to the bone. I feel like I can whip somebody's butt with this armor on, right? Come on. You would feel the same way. Don't act all holy on me, right? So here's the thing. I put it on and said, yeah, I'm a fat guy in a little coat. Can't wear this. But, guys, let me share something with you. Uh, stay right here real quickly. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 10 through 24, this is important. Watch this. The Bible says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his, not yours, in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Not part of it. Come on, guys. But the full armor armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Let's go on. The Bible says, for our struggle is not, say that with me, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Guys, we've been uh, talking about spiritual warfare. I cannot begin to tell you the number of texts and uh, things that we've been getting. 
all across the church, um, even outside of the church, people just texting in and just talking about the things that the enemy um, is doing and, um, and, and how they're having to stand strong against thoughts of suicide, people that have never contemplated it before, things that, that the enemy is just coming against them in a, in a very real way. Spiritual warfare is a real thing, right? Um, there is a very real war going on in the heavenlies. It is a war that we cannot avoid. Um, and because we can't see the enemy, oftentimes we, 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 we say, well, he's invisible, but he is very real. But we have to understand this. We don't need to be afraid of the enemy, but we do need to be on guard against him. John 10, 10 says this, that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Good news is, is that scripture goes on to say, but, but Jesus has come to give us life and give it to us more abundantly, right? So whatever the enemy comes to do, that's all right, because Jesus has our back. We just have to understand this. Our problem is not with each other. It is with the enemy, and he is the enemy of our souls. Guys, I love, I love what she said. If I could reiterate for, quick, for just a quick second, we don't need to be afraid, but we do need to be on guard. Amen. Mm -hmm. How many of you would agree today that as a believer, every day you are engaged in a battle, right? And what that means is, is that you and I are in an all-out assault against the adversary who is trying to take you out. Out. Amen. Yeah. But let's look what Paul said. Let's go further. Paul said to stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. He went on to say with the breastplate of righteousness in place. I'm going to talk about that just a little bit more in a minute. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Paul went on to say in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Then he went on to say, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Guys, I love what Paul said. He said, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And you got to remember today that Paul was actually looking at a Roman soldier's uniform when he was riding to the church of Ephesus. Now keep in mind, if you were here last week, we told you three things about the belt. And I want to I recap quickly. Number one, the belt was the first thing to be put on. Why? Because uh, it was a six to eight inch leather strap that was one of the most important pieces of all the armor. Number two, it was foundational. What does that mean? It meant that every single piece of the armor fastened to the belt. We talked last week about the belt was equivalent to a, a belt on a police officer. It had your gun. It had your pepper spray. It had your handcuffs. had a billy club. Listen, if you were a cop and you went out to, uh, to arrest somebody and didn't have a belt, you're about to get your butt beat. Come on, guys. You got to have that belt. Last week, we said it was like Batman because everything on the belt was needed for you to win in battle. But not the Roman soldiers. But not the Roman soldiers, right? right. Listen, here's the key. This belt actually housed and held your sword, mm. and it actually had another piece that actually would buckle the breastplate to this belt to keep everything in place. The third thing we said is it had long leather straps that would protect your, your loin and your groin. Why? Because the devil likes to hit below the belt. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah. We said that ma uh, Satan's the master of deception. He operates by keeping us in the dark. We spoke last week a lot about the truth because the belt is the truth, right? The belt is the truth. He's, uh, it's the light of the word. Psalm 119, 105 says this, God's word is the lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. Um, we're we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but we've got to put on, every morning, put on the belt of truth daily. And then we're going to move on to that next piece that Cole is wearing, and that's the breastplate. All right, guys, one more time. The Bible says stand firm then. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place. Why does it have to be in place? Because if it's not in the proper place, guess what's going to happen? When you go into battle, it's going to get loose and fall off and you become an open target. Mm. Are you hearing me today? Now, let, let me give you some pretty cool background about this armor. First of all, we find out that it was actually made of slats of bronze or iron and a higher up official or a, maybe a captain or lieutenant or a general didn't have this type of armor. Instead, he might have had a, 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 an armor made out of uh, like a, a coat of mail, kind of like you see 
in the ancient days of knights. And it, what happened is they would actually wear this piece, and it was known in the Latin, instead of breastplate, it was called the heart guard. Mm. That's very important. I'm going to share a little bit more about that in just a second. But the really cool thing is, is that this breastplate actually um, was made out of iron or bronze, but behind the metal had a thick piece of leather. This is important. And at the bottom of the leather, it actually had buckles that it would belt, it would buckle the, the breastplate and the righteousness or the, the, the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth together. Why is that important? Because truth holds everything in place. Can you say amen? And this was so strong. Do you feel that? This was so strong that according to commentaries, it could take a direct blow from a spear or a sword, but it could not penetrate the armor. Listen, this is very important. The breastplate protected your heart and your bowel. So here's the cool part. The entire armor weighed about 70 pounds from head to toe. But this breastplate in of itself that went around the shoulders to protect you, according to commentaries, weighed about 20 pounds. That's pretty heavy, right? Just the breastplate alone weighed 20 pounds and was almost impenetrable. But here's the cool part. Watch this. The breastplate was meant to protect the vital organs of a soldier. Why? Because it protected the heart and it protected the bowels because that was known as the kill shots. If your breastplate ever fell off, you were an open target for the enemy because if they hit you in the heart or the stomach, you were out for the count. So the breastplate protected some of those vital parts in your body. Now, here's what's cool. Watch this. Why is the breastplate so important this morning? Why are we talking about that? Listen, this is very important. The breastplate that we call the breastplate, or Paul rather referred to as the breastplate of righteousness, is so important because the enemy is after your heart and he's after your bowels. What does that mean? you got to remember when Paul was writing in a, in a first century Roman context, when Paul talked about your heart and your bowels, the, the readers of Paul's letter knew exactly what he was talking about that you and I might find confusing today. Because we think your thoughts come from where? Your head. But in reality, according to the Bible, your heart, uh, your thoughts come from your heart, not your head. And even Jesus backed that up. Watch this. Jesus said in Romans, or in Matthew rather, chapter 15 and verse 19, for from the heart, watch this, come evil thoughts. Not the head. Are you with me? But from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, Adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. From the head, no, from the heart, right? Let's go on. Luke 6.45, Jesus also said, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So where's our thoughts come from, our head or our heart? Our heart. Solomon said in Proverbs 23, verse 7, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. All right, let's go on. Are you getting what I'm saying today? All right, let's go on. Not only does it cover the heart, it also covers the bowels. The bowels were the seat of emotions. All right, watch this. Have you ever did something... Or says something immediately, you had this gut-wrenching feeling or this pit in your stomach. What is that? That's your bowels, right? Your emotions are tied to your bowels. Are you hearing me today? As a matter of fact, have you ever did anything that all of a sudden made you sick to your stomach? Or you, you said something, you did something, and all of a sudden you had a pit in your stomach. Can I tell you today, that is exactly what the enemy is after. He's after your heart and your bowels. He's after your thoughts and your emotions. Can I say something quickly? It's not wrong to have emotions, but it's wrong if emotions have you. Guys, if you've never read Pastor Jennifer's book, Get Over Yourself, isn't that an awesome title, by the way? If you've never read Get Over Yourself, we got a copy in the back you could buy today on the way out. Can I get a witness? Listen. Now listen to me, guys. I said all that to say this. She has a couple of awesome chapters in her book that explains in vivid and perfect detail about this war between the heart and the bowels or this war that takes place in your 
thoughts and your emotions. Pastor Jennifer, take it away. Cole, love you, brother. You're Thanks, good. brother. Give him a hand clap, if you will, please. Little jealous that I couldn't wear that, but anyway. Yeah. I mean, he was dancing around the house and that thing a little bit. It took me a little bit of time to explain to him that it didn't fit because the entire back piece didn't come together, like, like not even close to come together. Kind of doesn't fit you, honey. Anyways, we had to find a smaller yet still large specimen. All right. So whether you recognize it or not, when Pastor is talking about our thinking and our feeling or our heart and our bowels, he's describing our soul. And Psalm 143 and 3 says this, that Satan is the enemy of our soul, right? Um, thankfully, and it's not up on the screen, but thankfully, Psalm 23 and 3 says that God is the restorer of our soul. So again, we don't have to be afraid of the enemy, but we do have to be on guard, and we have to understand that God wants to restore our heart. He, has to re he wants to restore those things, but the enemy's after those things. He's after them, and he is diligently pursue them. If you could put up that will diagram if you wouldn't mind, um, this actually is a, a, um, something that God gave me years ago because I needed to understand um, what was going on on the inside of me. And I, I, I told you a few weeks ago that I was caught in this. Um, I knew that I was saved, but there were so many emotions and feelings and thoughts and memories and imaginations that I was having. I was, I was kind of caught and tugged between my old life and my new one, the one that I wanted to live. And I, I, I spent most of my time in that tug, and it was exhausting. And it had gotten to the place where it was exhausting me, but it was really exhausting him after a while. And I've always said that um, if your issues are your issues and you like them and you want to hang out with them, that's fine if, it, if they only affect you. But when your issues become everybody else's problem, then they've got to change. You've got to change. When the entire world needs to dance around your issues and, and everyone in the room has to stop to cater to you and the whole world revolves around you, then something's wrong with that picture, right? Because we were made to serve others, to be there for others, hence the title, Get Over Yourself. And it's not that we just need to get over our pain and our shame and move on. It's that sometimes we need to go back in order to move forward, right? We need to understand that the enemy is trying to get to our wills. We, we will ourselves to stop serving God. We will ourselves. And some of you are going to say, well, that's not true. I, I've never willed myself to stop. Well, we might say, well, the enemy made me do it, but in truth, and we've talked about this before, you've seen this before if you've been here long enough, we say that the enemy made me do it, but in all honesty, what he does is he uses these parts of our soul, because we usually say that our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions, but in truth, there's actually more parts to it. It is your emotions. Emotions are nothing but our thoughts put into motion, right? You think enough about something, you start to feel it and it starts to move you, right? You think on it, if you don't cast it down, that thought becomes something we begin to feel. And you can physically feel it. If you think about something that somebody said something to you, you'll start getting just hot on the inside of you, right? And then it'll start to move you to where it's like, you know what, I'm gonna say this to him the next time, you right? And so it starts to move you. Emotions are thoughts put into motion. Um, our, our intellect. See, these things in that first box, that is a part of your bowel and your heart. It's what the enemy's after. It's what he uses to move our will, to move us in the direction where we're not serving Christ today. See, we're made the righteousness of Christ Jesus. We take our position in Christ Jesus as the righteousness of God. But then, based on our position in Christ, we are then called to walk that out on a daily basis. We'll talk about that in a moment. So he uses our emotions, he uses our intellect. Have you ever met anybody too smart for God? I mean, they will sit around and they will reason it out and they will just sit there and go, you know what, is, is that really how that works though, seriously? Like, Christ just took our place, and, and, and that is just that easy. They'll reason their way out of things. They're just too smart for their own good. You ever met anybody like that? The enemy is using sometimes very intelligent people. They'll use their intellect to talk themselves out of things that are faith-based. 
And so they can't wrap their minds around the things of God. They'll use our imagination. Have you ever been in that place where, where the enemy uses your imagination to go back to a place? He convinces us that the grass is always greener on the other side. We're right here in this life, and instead of working on what's wrong in this life or working on something that God's put in front of you, we'll just go, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. It's, you know, if I had just married that guy or if I had just went to this place or if I was just in that, and we always have somewhere else we'd rather be. If I could just get there then, right? Guys, the grass is not always greener on the other side, and even if it looks to be, we hop that fence, we're still going to have to mow that grass. It probably has weeds, and it probably has insects there too, right? Right? So he uses our imagination to bring us places and to move us out of God's perfect will. He uses our memory. Has the enemy ever used your memory against you? Maybe a memory to tell you, to remind you of your past, of what you did so long ago, and maybe convince you that you're not forgiven. Maybe convince you that, maybe maybe just convince you that it was better back then. To maybe convince you that that sin, that it was fun. And we know that the Bible says that sin is fun for a season. But the truth of the matter is, is that the enemy never reminds us of those sleepless nights and those tear-filled days and those, that, that angst and that hurt and that regret. He just reminds us of all those memories that tug us back. Or on days like Mother's Day, he reminds us of things that are hurtful and painful. He causes many of us to not even want to get up and come to Mother's Day. Because what if they call for all mothers and then somebody will know that I too am a mother. I've just never held my baby in my arms. That mine's waiting on me in heaven, whether it be by choice or by chance, whether it be by abortion or miscarriage. Those memories is what the enemy uses to tug at our hearts and, and, and get us down or get us believing that we're not the righteousness of Christ, that God doesn't perform miracles, that he doesn't, he's not on our side, that he's not for us, that he's against us, that he could have done something, but he didn't. Are you with me? So he uses all those things to get to our will. And look, that next here, and we won't even get into it, is he uses what we can see and hear and taste and touch and feel and smell. He uses our our exterior to get to the interior he uses everything around us to move us on the inside and based on what we feel is where we normally move show us that next screen if you wouldn't mind we're going to wrap this up real quickly i chose this because this is what the enemy's after and i chose these little this clip because the the blue arrows if you notice have the arrows that go either way he wants our thoughts to turn into feelings that turn into actions that turn into thoughts again. Have you ever noticed that? You have a thought, you think on it enough, it turns into a feeling that moves you, it becomes an action, and then based on that action, then we, oh gosh, I'm thinking again, and now I'm feeling again. Well, I might as well do it again. And it becomes this, but watch, it can also happen the other way. Sometimes we can have a thought and we act on it, and based on that action, oh no, now we have a feeling, and based on that feeling, now we have a thought. See, we acted on something, and then based on that action, we went, oh my gosh, I'm a horrible person. (gasps) What will people think of me? You know what? If everybody hates me anyways, I might as well just do it again, and then we just keep going and going and going. So either way, we can go either way with that, and that is the cycle that the enemy gets us on, and some of you are just going, well, what does that have to do with the breastplate of righteousness? Guys, here's the thing. The enemy is after how we think, feel, and act. Because he's after how we live Mm -hmm. and how we do life on a daily basis. Why? You know, it's awesome. We've been talking about uh, that we are the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Amen. But what does that even mean? Well, first of all, let's, let's break the word down. The word righteousness means being in right standing with God. It means deemed morally right or justified. Now, watch this. The word justified means being made right by God. Okay, so I told you and we're gonna we're gonna kind of put a bow on this thing and and drive this home real quick. We wake up every morning, we take our position in Christ. We've been saying that, right? But what Paul is trying to say to us in these scriptures right here with this breastplate of righteousness is he's saying, You've got to guard your heart, you've got to guard your feelings, you've got to guard your emotions, you've got to guard your memories, you've got to guard your 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 imagination. See, 
a lot of times what we think is that we think that we're supposed to guard ourselves and we have a wrong conception of what that actually means. Guys, he's after our heart. Isn't it funny that Jesus is after your heart? But so is the enemy. That's why we're given a breastplate of righteousness, because the enemy's after your heart. He's after your heart. He's after your mind. He's after your emotions. He's after your, your, um, your, your memories. He's after all of those things that during the day get us off course and in a ditch, and we can't move. Because here's why. Righteousness, there's two different ways here. Paul's trying to say, listen, there's a positional righteousness. Can you put up the next one for me? There's a positional righteousness. That's what Jesus Christ already did. He says, this is your position. You are positionally right. But Paul's saying, hang on a second. You're not just put in that position. Now that you're put in that position, now there's a practical righteousness you need to start carrying out. Practical righteousness is day-to-day -day choosing to live uprightly before God. You know what that means? It means two words we really never hear, hear put together anymore in this world. Personal holiness. What? Don't tell me how to live. Why not? You are the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And based on the fact of who you are, how is it that we can look at our children and say, you are a Beckham. Do not act like that. What does that actually mean? It means you carry our name. Don't go crapping all over yourself with our name. Is that what it means? Can I tell you something? Why would we say that to our children and then not think anything of the fact that I carry the name of Jesus into a world where it's all messed up and we carry so sloppily the name of Jesus do you know why it makes sense that he would say there's positional righteousness now based on that there's practical righteousness wake up every day take your position put on the breastplate know who you are and now walk a life that is worthy of your calling Live a life worthy of your calling. You carry the name of Jesus. You carry his name. Some of you are just going, oh, so you're telling me i got to get it right, that i got to live perfectly, that I've got to get everything right, that I've got to do this. Galatians 5 and 16 says this, So I tell you, live in the way that the Spirit leads you. Then you will not do the evil things that your sinful self wants. Pastor's going to read three quick verses, and we're going to wrap this up. And this, this is going to get under your skin because it got under mine, but you need to hear it. All right, watch this. James 1, look at this, guys. The Bible says, a man is tempted to do wrong when he lets himself, did you get that? When he lets himself be led by his bad thoughts, tell him to do. His, his bad thoughts. When he does what his bad thoughts tell him to do, he sins. When sin completes its work, it brings death. James, by the way, the Lord's half-brothers went on to say, My Christian friends, do not be fooled by this. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2.14, watch this, I'm about to preach. He said, do everything without grumbling, murmuring, complaining, or arguing with who? Each other. Remember, your battle's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities amen then he finally went on to say in ephesians 4 31 and 32 talking about our emotions or our bowels watch this don't be bitter come on i'm preaching to somebody angry mad don't shout angrily or say things to hurt others come on, we're supposed to build each other up not tear each other down yeah, come on right never do anything evil am i convicting anybody or just myself come on guys be kind and loving to each other Forgive each other the same as God forgave you through Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you did those verses hit right between the eyes beside your pastor? Come on, you didn't raise your hand. We're going to pray for liars at the altar. Amen. Come on. It, it applied to everybody, right? One more time. Listen, it's not wrong to have emotions, but it's wrong if your emotions have you. Hmm. So we read these verses. 
Pastor read earlier, no immorality, no slander, no theft, no evil thoughts. Guys, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And so here's what we want you to see. What, what he's asking of us is this. And I want to I say this to you, and I want you to hear it with everything inside of me. Because we are covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, this is now going to be somewhere in my office. Because we are covered by the righteousness of Christ Jesus, it does not guarantee that we will live every moment as we ought to. But it does guarantee that we can. It does guarantee that we can. It does guarantee that we can. Because we now know and understand that everything that comes out of us, it's because something got in. The breastplate. How many of you have ever seen that that ship or that that boat on the water it's a it's a you've probably seen it on instagram it's a picture i've posted it before but it's the water that gets into the boat that sinks it not what's around it guys i want you to understand because we're the righteousness of christ jesus when we are being tempted when thoughts when things happen during our day when things are coming at us we can run to the lord and we can say god you know my thoughts before i think them you know where my heart's going i need your help see the problem is is that because we're the righteousness of christ jesus we feel so ashamed that we're even thinking these things that we don't run to god because we feel like lord if i'm yours you're going to be mad at me if i tell you what i'm thinking but he already knows so we can. We're not always going to get it right, but we can because we have him. And because we're his righteousness, we can run to him. You see, all the things that he named in those three verses, all the murmuring, complaining, all the bitterness, all the anger, all that stuff, that's an outward expression of something that's going on on the inside. See, the complaining happens, the murmuring happens, the finding, finding um, all the negativity that spews out of people that just didn't happen overnight. Something got in. He said that breastplate was impenetrable. Do you know what that tells me? If that's coming out of them, that means that something penetrated that breastplate. And it seeped in there, and they didn't handle it, and now it's just seeping out of them. See, negative people don't start that way. No. No, you, you start murmuring, complaining. You start becoming that person. Because something got in there and it began to grow and then it changes who you are. You ever met those people that, that they can't see, they, they, they see something that's so good in somebody and it bothers them so bad that they've got to find one bad thing in them so it makes them feel better about themselves. They, 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 they will find something to tear somebody else down. Because you know what? They didn't start out that way. But something got in there. I started tearing them down, and it got in there. You know, one of my favorite uh, preachers, my, one of my favorite speakers, writers, is a guy named Andy Andrews. And even to this day, his kids are teenagers, even to this day, he does this thing. I've told you this before, where he does what he calls a heart check. And he sits down with his kids, goes into their room, sits down on their bed or in, you know, on the floor next to their bed, puts his hand on their heart, and I know that many of you do this, where you count your blessings at the end of the, of the night, and that's a great thing. He does something I love. They put their hand on their heart, and they said, okay, let's do a heart check. Is there anything that happened today that hurt your heart? Anybody say anything to you? Anybody do anything to you today that hurt your heart? Any unforgiveness towards anybody? Anybody you need to forgive? Anybody you probably need to ask forgiveness of. And he kind of goes through that heart check so that he's not going to sleep with that on his heart because he understands that whatever you let in, it's going to grow and it's going to change you. It's going to change you. You see, I love that because the Bible tells us right here that we're supposed to be every day waking up and putting on this breastplate and some of you are going so pastor you're telling me that i have to walk rightly every day before the lord that's 
That's tough. I'm not going to get it right. Here's the cool thing. If the belt and the breastplate is lined up properly, one has hooks here and the other has hooks here. If it's lined up properly, first of all, if it's not lined up properly, if your truth's not on right, your righteousness will be all over the place. So there's a very good tip that will save you some counseling time. If your righteousness is all over the place, your marriage is in the toilet, your life's screwed up, your finances are all screwed up, everything's wonky in your life, here's the first place to check. Is your truth on right? Because your righteousness is all over the place. Check your own holiness. Check your own life if everything else in your life is wonky. There's a tip. Because it's made and designed that they would fasten into each other. So when one's on properly, the other one's on tight. Here's the other thing. Without rehearsal, Cole put on that breastplate, and Anthony was fastening it all in. He was standing there at the bottom, uh, uh, at the bottom of the stairs, in front of the mirror. I was at the uh, top of the stairs in the office, and... Anthony had already talked about the fact that it's a tough thing to tell people the breastplate of righteousness is about living right. It's about putting it on every morning, realizing who you are and going and living right. That's hard. That's heavy. Because I'm not always going to get it right. I failed all three of those verses. My neighbors, they don't come to church because they hear me. <laughs> we live on a preserve. And when I yell, it bounces off the trees and into their houses. Tell me. Tell me. Guys, without rehearsal, Anthony and I were talking about how heavy it was. Cole puts on the stuff, and he looks at his dad, and he says, Man, this thing's heavy. How do people walk in this? How do people fight in this? And I said, Cole, I'm so glad you said this. Because this is heavy, guys. But as the righteousness of Christ Jesus, he's asking us, walk uprightly before me. Practice personal holiness. You won't always get it right, but because you are in me, you can get it right. You can. And here's the good news. The more you wear it, the more you get used to it, the stronger you become. Go ahead. Guys, let me share. How many of you know the resistance builds strength? Right? Do you realize that armor, that, that breastplate weighed about 20 pounds? And, and the soldiers had to wear about, a, a, and the armor from top to bottom weighed about 70 pounds. Some commentaries say it weighed up to 100 pounds. They had to carry that in battle. Uh, before the first service, I called Steve, who's down in Auburndale, visiting his mom today. And I said, let me ask you a question. You're a former Marine guy. I said, in the Marines, where you were having to run, what did all of your gear weigh? He said, in the excess of about 100 pounds. He said, now, when we were in boot camp, he said it was extremely heavy. I said, well, what happened as you continued to carry that weight? He said, I got stronger, and it was not as heavy as it was when I started. Guys, there is a sermon there. Watch this. The more you fight the devil, the more you have the armor of God on, use the sword of the Spirit, which is, by the way, the very Word of God. The more you fight the devil, the better you get at it. Come on, guys. And the more you carry the armor on, you get stronger because of resistance. And it's no longer as heavy as it used to be because you're stronger now than you were before. Yes. Some of the thoughts, some of the emotions that used to knock me out for days and weeks and months. It takes me minutes now to recognize them, cast them down, and cast them out. On a bad day, an hour, two, three, if it's really a bad week. But I've gotten stronger because I recognize how he works, and I don't fight people I fight him. He is my enemy. I know that he is after my heart and my emotions. I know that he is tugging on my memories, my imagination. I know that it's him every time. Every time. 
as long as I can recognize it, all I've got to do then is make a choice. And once you know it, if you walk into it, it's your choice. If you ever counsel with me, I will get to the po point where I will look at you, probably after the third time we've met over the same situation, and I will look at you and I will say, this is a choice. You have to make the next step. I cannot do it for you. I cannot do it for you. You have all the tools. You have the truth. You have the righteousness. Now walk in it. Now walk in it. Last week we said to gird up and get to battle. And this week our verse is this. Proverbs 4 and 23. And this is how we'll end today. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart. Guard your emotions. Guard your memories. Guard your imaginations. Don't let the enemy sit there and play the violin while you go on a little, <laughs> a little ride about what it would be, what it could be. But if I just... He brings you back to what you did, what you lost. You're not thinking about what you have. You might say, what does all this have to do with Mother's Day? Because you said that there was a slant. Well, I can't think of a group of people who are more affected by emotions and memories and imaginations and thoughts then mamas and women and men too but if I'm being super honest today as I sat down the Lord just started pouring out of me I've been so guilty of being that pastor that says, it's Mother's Day. I'm a mama. Let's celebrate moms. Knowing that Mom's Day is one of those days that tugs on your emotions, your memories of what you've lost, of what you don't have, of by choice or by chance what you don't have. It's one of those times. And I don't want to make Mother's Day sad. I, I, in fact, I want you to leave here knowing that God sees you, all of you, all of you. That he knows when it's hard and he says, run to me. All you who are heavy, all you who are burdened, take on my yoke. Come to me. I see how the enemy has gotten in there and he's hurt your heart. God says, guard your heart because the enemy is after your soul, your thoughts, your feelings, your desires, your memories, your imagination, and your reasoning. He'll tempt you to quit. He'll tempt you to throw in the towel to end it all. He'll use your memories against you to remind you of your past, to tell you not, you're not forgiven, to entice you back into your sin. He'll get you overthinking, always contemplating, hyper-offended, super-sensitive, ultra-paranoid at all times. He'll keep you hurt, keep you sad, keep you depressed, angry, bitter, confused in utter chaos all the time if you'll let him. You know, last week I, I, we told you this to stay in the light of God's word and this week we're telling you to guard your heart. And I've been guilty of being that pastor that says I just want to celebrate Mother's Day. And then God brought me some people over the last year that gave me a little bit different perspective on some things.
And we have a gift in the back, and that gift Stephanie, would you bring me one of those, please? That's on the back. This little lantern. We have a gift for the moms in the house today. You'll be getting one of those, honey. Thank you. This little gift right here, it says Psalm 119, 105. And that's the verse that says that he's our lamp and our light. Stay in the light. Don't let him drag you into the dark. That's where he does his best work. And inside of it, because we couldn't have Mother's Day without chocolate, is two hearts. You're welcome. I mean, I will write a sermon to fit into the chocolate rather than to chocolate into the sermon. But. And there's a, there's a chocolate heart in there because you've got to guard your heart. You've got to stay in the light, and you've got to guard your heart. And for those that are non-moms, or aren't women at all, you get chocolate too. It's in the bag. Because you have to guard your heart. God is after your heart. He wants your heart desperately, but the enemy wants it just as badly. And I want to be very aware to honor moms that are in this building who have never held their babies in their arms. See, God has brought me some people, sorry, recently who want nothing more than to be a mother. But for whatever reason, can't have children yet. And then if I'm being honest, I've never really thought about those moms on Mother's Day. And I've always been that one that, stand up if you're a mom, have a gift. And God wanted to make sure that whether you're a mom in here today, because there are different moms, there's the imperfect mom, that would be me, my mom, perfect mom. If I'm a quarter of the mom that my mom is, I, I'll be doing good. There's those mothers that you're at this age and stage, and this day represents for you all the things that you've done wrong. <laughs> There's the childless mother, either by chance or choice. There's moms in this room today. Nobody ever acknowledges you. And for some of you, you're really glad because you're not a mom with a child in your arms because you chose to not have that child in your arms and you stand here today and you are desperately afraid that we're gonna that someone's gonna find you out if you would do me a favor and put up the screen starting with the red one if you're here today I want you to know that God wanted to make today about healing your heart just as much about guarding your heart and that there is no earth, or the earth has no sorrow. There is no sorrow that heaven can't heal. And that if you're a mama that has gone through Mother's Day and you have never been able to take a Mother's Day gift and be able to say, I know that one day I will be able to hold my baby in heaven because I know that I'm forgiven. I know that God loves me. And I know that the choice that I made back then to not be a mother is nothing that will keep me from the arms of my God. God wants to heal you today. And if you're a mama that's here today that's never gotten a Mother's Day gift, but you should absolutely be recognized as someone that was once told that you're gonna be a mama and then for whatever reason, you had to bear the same pain, that same pain of what happened, why, why me, what did I do? Go to the next one, please. I wanna encourage you today that the Lord is near the brokenhearted and he saves the crushed. God loves you. 
he is here for you. He so much cares about your heart that he says there's a breastplate because your heart matters so much. I want to heal up that heart. Go to the next if you would. You see, whether you recognize it or not, what God is saying to us today is I am your creator and you were in my care even before you were born. I am your creator. I don't want you to think about anything else. I want you to hear those words. I am your creator. I created you. I formed you in your mother's womb. You may be here today and say, yeah, but see, that's why Mother's Day is sad for me because I don't even know my mother. Well, then all the better because God wants you to know that you still have a purpose. There's still a plan for you that you may not know your mother, but your God knows you and that you can rest assured that he knew all about you when he knitted you together and there is no accident and that there is healing in those words. I am your creator. I formed you. Go to the next. Because all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I want you to hear that with your whole heart. God formed all of your days. And you might say, but wait a second. You mean he, he knew about the day when I was eight and I was going to do that? Or the day when I was 13 and I did that? Or when I was 17 and I did that and I made that choice at the age of 21? Yes, he knew all of that. And that is why he made Jesus, had Jesus come to the earth. He made a way. Knowing the choices that we would make, he made a way. He knew all of your days from beginning to end. And that's why he looked down on all of us and said, based on where they're going on their own. I need a plan, and his name is Jesus. I'm going to make a way for their hurts to be healed, for their hearts to be restored, for their lives to be complete, and his name is Jesus. Would you go to the next, please? You see, whether you recognize it or not, you are an absolute miracle. You, God made you, formed you, created you. You are a miracle. And if you don't recognize that God can still do a miracle, just look in the mirror because you are a miracle. You are a miracle. He can make a way where there seems to be no way and there is nothing that is out of his hands. Is there another? Today as you're leaving, you have this gift. And I want to make sure that mamas go back there. Now, if you're a mom that has a, a child in kids' church, you have a special one being made for you by your child, so you don't have to pick one up in the back. But if you're here today and you're a mama of any kind, an adoptive mama, a spiritual mama, I don't have any biological mama, but I've got about 10 spiritual ones that I've raised, then you're a mama. Perhaps you're here today... Whatever kind of mama you are, no one's going to ask you questions. No one's going to ask you what happened. It's in the back. You could take it as you leave. God wants you to know that he sees you, that he honors you, that he knows you, that he knows what's in your heart, and that he wants to heal all of it because he needs your heart. That's why he needs you to guard it. He needs it. He wants to use it because there's a hurting world that needs hope and that hope can only be found in Jesus.